Nike is down 18% over the last 12 months, heading towards its 52-week low. So is this a golden opportunity to buy this undervalued company? We're going to take a look today. We want to look at their top-line revenue growth as well as their bottom-line net income. Understand if the competition is taking away any of their revenue. We're going to look at the health of the company, their total cash versus their total debt. We'll have a quick look at some of their other competitors if they have been performing better over the last few years. We'll also discuss some insider selling we have noted last month by the executive chairman. And we'll also look towards the institutions if they are buying shares of Nike or they are selling. And as always, we'll touch upon their dividend safety score. We'll look at those financial metrics. And we want to take a look at their latest shareholder letter, pull out some key facts and figures that have been discussed. And we'll take a look at the market share of footwear, whether or not Nike is still a large contender for that top spot. And don't forget, as always, we'll run them through the valuation model, getting to that important intrinsic value as well as our acceptable buy price. We'll look at the margin of safety and also see what are Wall Street forecasting in terms of a price target and upside. So let's jump into this company. Now, Nike is down 18%. Do bear in mind it doesn't include dividends reinvested. However, over the last 10 years, you would be up 150%. Although we do note their all-time highs of $178 are a few years away. Now, they are trading towards that 52-week low. They do offer now a forward yield of 1.52% and a forward P of 27.11%. Now, in terms of their top line growth, what we want to see is a minimum of that 3 to 7% year on year. May 2019, they reported 39 billion to that top line. May 23, five years later, 51.2 billion. So what we can see is over the last five years, they have been growing that top line. We do note some inconsistencies. May 2019 to 2020, we see that drop, although we could justify that due to COVID, the lockdown. It then rebounded very strongly into 2021 and onwards to 2023. Now, we're not too far away from their latest annual accounts, May 2024. But based on the trailing 12 months, we can see their top line looks like there has been minimal movement over that period. So it'll be interesting to see how Nike are going to be taking a look at increasing their top line for that annual report. In terms of bottom line, 4 billion reported in 2019, 5.1 in 2023. So we also see growth to their bottom line. But on a more granular level, we do see a little bit more inconsistencies. An increase or in fact a decrease to the COVID year 2020. It then rebounded very strongly into 21 and 22 before decreasing into 2023. So both top line and bottom line over the last five years have increased. However, we do know inconsistencies on both of them. So do bear that in mind. Now a quick look at the company's health check. Total cash versus total debt. 4.7 billion in 2019. Latest quarterly report, 9.9 .9 billion. So they've essentially doubled their cash and short term investments from just five years ago. Importantly, though, now we want to see numerically and directionally their total debt. And we can see 3.9 billion in 2019. 12.2 billion in that latest quarter report. So their total debt has increased quite significantly, although it isn't too far off now their total cash position. So we'll discuss that when we look at those net debt to EBITDA metrics. Now, other contenders in the footwear industry, we have Deckers, we have On Holding, Sketches, Crocs and Puma. Over the last year, what we can see is Nike is down 17%. It is, in fact, the second worst performing. So again, bear that in mind. Only worse off, or in fact, only better to Puma that we see down 23%. This is a total return. So this is if you reinvest those dividends. On the last five years, though, we can see they did perform a little better in sort of the middle of their competitors, up 21%. But again, it isn't something that is really great from any investment over a five-year period. We see Deckers up significantly better, 537%. And we see Crocs around 385 Now, just because Nike hasn't had the greatest return over the last five years, it doesn't necessarily mean it won't happen over the next Something to bear in mind, always important that the past performance is never an indicator of future. Now, the executive chairman, as we see, Mark P here, did sell around 168,000 shares. That earned him around $17.7 million. But again, just because we can see, in fact, since that point, the share is down 6.4%. It isn't necessarily a bearish signal. It is something we factor into our analysis. 
But again, do remember that these people do sometimes need that cash for whatever reason, personal or financial. But again, something we do want to show for transparency. Now, institutional ownership sits at around 63%. 10 billion worth of outflows by the institutions over the last 12 months, a lot more inflows by the same institutions over the same period. So we can see they do like this stock. This is one that they do hold and quite a lot of that they have been buying over the period. When we look at Q1 of 2023, we see more buying than selling, a lot more buying in Q2, a little bit more buying in Q3. And in the latest quarter, Q4 institutions have been buying more. So Overall, this is one that those institutions do like and continue to hold and continue to buy. But again, something I just want to say, just bear that in mind. It isn't something you should base your own analysis off, but it is one layer that we add into our own. Now, this is just a very quick essential run through of the shareholder letter that Nike released on their essential annual report. And what we can see here is they're saying that there's never been a better time to be Nike. Now, they do run some pointers. You can go and read that. It is readily accessible on the internet. We just wanted to draw on this a few points, maybe some things that were a bit surprised that they have decided to include. But we can see they're essentially showing their revenue, their top line has been increasing over the last five years. We can see essentially what we ran through, that inconsistency in 2019 to 2020. Earnings per share as well, it has increased over the long term, but we do know in fact the 2023 EPS is lower than both 2022 and 2021. The return on invested capital, again, we're going to look at this as well. 31.5%, very strong, but again, lower than the previous two years. And we can see the performance versus the S&P 500 over the last five years has underperformed 54% versus 69. Now, interestingly, they have showed this information. Not a lot of it is glowing, but again, something they have included, something to bear in mind, especially the performance versus the S&P, as the argument then does become, is it just better to put your money in the S&P 500 rather than picking stocks, especially when you have contenders like Nike who have underperformed? Now, one thing that we want to point out, now this is from 2022, so it is about one year old, but we can even see in 2022, Nike are still the essential leaders in the footwear industry due to the number of sales. 29.1 billion, far outperforming Adidas, which is 13 billion. Then we have Skechers at 7.4. So there is a lot of talk about Nike becoming removed from the market share by other competitors. We have Skechers, we have Deckers, we have ON. But for the time being, they do still hold a very large market share. From when I was reading, this sits around 35%. So Nike isn't going anywhere anytime soon. A lot of people, though, do tend to have this bearish analysis of Nike for the future. Do let me know, though, your thoughts in the comments below. As always, just to let you know, we are releasing our next free weekly article tomorrow, a very great article. If you want to gain access to that or any of these other articles completely free, Click on that pinned comment below to sign up and get access straight away. Now, dividend safety score sits at 99. It is very safe. The market cap around 148 billion, a mega cap company. Recessionary metrics, while they increased the dividend during the last recession, they had above average growth, negative 7% versus the S&P's negative 12. They also outperformed the S&P negative 36. As we can see here, the S&P's negative 55. Dividend growth looking very strong, 9% high single digit in November 23, double digit over the last five years, double digit over the last 20 years, a very strong dividend growth company with respect to those increases. They've also been increasing the dividends for the last 21 years, so four years away from becoming a dividend aristocrat and have been paying dividends for the last 39 without a reduction. Now, dividend yield theory, we have a double sign here of undervaluation, 1.51 yield versus 1.02 on the five-year rolling average, probably the highest or if not one of the highest yields they have offered over the last five years. And the forward PE, 25 versus 32, again, we do see undervaluation, but we do know the consumer discretionary sector PE sits slightly lower or in fact significantly lower at 15.3. But bear in mind, we don't look at any of these models in isolation and we conclude towards the end. Now, on the free cash flow power, we use a blanket rule below 60%. The reason why I use this, it gives me faith that management can offer those double-digit increases. Now, one reason why we tend to ignore the earnings, it is susceptible to manipulation. And as we can see in 2020, if you were to look at that 52%, you'd probably be pleased with yourself. But what this signals, in 2020, management paid out more in dividends than they generated in free cash flow. Since then, though, we do see it positive 28% the following year and the last two years at 42%, very strong. 2024 expected 26%, so we should be seeing a nice double-digit increase 
to their dividends soon. Free cash flow per share has been increasing nearly three times growth over the last 10 years, moving in the right direction, although we have the inconsistencies. 2024 expect to see some strong growth to that free cash flow, which is what we love to see as investors. Sales growth, whilst not double digit every single year, at least obtaining that steady moderate growth target that we look for for 3 to 7%. Last year, though, very, very nice 10%. We love to see that. Based on the trailing 12 months, even that 5% is still fairly acceptable. Numerically speaking, then, they've gone from 28 billion sales in 2014 to 51 in 2023. They also do share buybacks, well, maybe not as consistently as you'd like, but they do return that excess cash to investors, 1.81 billion down to 1.55. ROIC, as we did analyze earlier, remember this is a strong metric. We want to see this at least 10%, so we are faithful that management are allocating that capital effectively. And what we can see here, 29% in 2014 has started to decrease over the longer term, but even in the low 20s is still a very strong indicator of management. Operating margin and free cash flow margin straddling around the 12% on the operating side. Still fairly positive. It hasn't really gone below that bar that COVID year. Free cash flow margin as well. Pretty much been above that consistently other than the COVID year. 10% over the last two years. A very good indicator of this company and that free cash flow generation. Net debt to EBITDA then earnings before interest tax depreciation amortization signals two things. That balance sheet strength as well as dividend safety. 0.19 in 2023, effectively showing us how many years it would take them to pay off all of their debt net of cash on hand. Expected to increase, but relatively small increase in 2024. So no real worries with their dividend safety, no worries at all with the balance sheet based on this information. So let's jump into the evaluation. And don't forget, if you are enjoying the content, values being provided, smash that like button, hit that subscribe and bell button so you are continually notified of these videos as they drop. Now, the first model we're using is the dividend discount model. We have the yearly dividends, very strong, around 11% on average over this period. 9% or just under in the more recent year. We've gone extremely conservative at 6.75. This gives an intrinsic value of $126. So we have that first signal of undervaluation, although bear in mind we're not looking at any of these models in isolation. We then have the free cash flow year on year. Average growth rate, pretty high, 40%. But we do go for a target of 10% to be a bit more conservative. With that discount rate, we get the present value of future free cash flows and terminal value. Add together with the cash, subtract total debt, get to the equity value, divide by shares outstanding. And we can see an intrinsic value of $102. Whilst we have the undervaluation signal, it isn't too far off that market price. So the intrinsic value in today's episode is the average of these two models. And for today's Nike episode, we get a price of $114. Now, do bear in mind, you can grab a copy of this valuation model if you want to get to the intrinsic value as well as the acceptable buy price of companies in your portfolio or even in your watch list. Margin of safety then, 10%, three criteria, wide moat, strong financial metrics, good forward-looking data. If you believe that, it is a buy up to $103. At the 15% mark, a buy not too far, in fact, off the current trading price. So we see a 15% MOS level based on our estimates and judgments. Now, do let me know your thoughts in the comments below whether or not that is one that you are looking for a 15% margin or for those looking at around 20%, a buy up to 91 and those looking for an extreme 25% MOS level, $86. So with a 15% margin of safety, Wall Street are forecasting a very high upside of double digit 26% with their price target of $123. As always, keen to hear your thoughts, not just on this price, whether or not you believe it's undervalued and are looking to buy, but whether or not you see Nike over the next two years, their market share eroding with other competitors taking a bigger piece of the pie. As always, if you enjoyed today's episode, smash that like button, hit that subscribe and bell button. And as always, we'll see you on the next one.